take this opportunity to plug my classes. Um, in case any of you are interested, next semester I will be teaching a class on gender and Hinduism. Um, and we'll be talking about not just women, because gender is not just about women, but it's also about men and also the third sex um, that figures into Hinduism. And I'm really excited about it. I'm still formulating the course um, as we speak. Um, and so I think for those of you who are really interested in this topic, um, we're going to cover a wide range of material uh, from the ancient period to the modern period. Um, and I also do offer a class on Hindu goddesses, which is actually what I'm going to be talking to you about tonight, um, which is a nice segue from um, Ramya's performance for us. Um, before we get going, I want to just offer up a word or two about myself, just because my credentials might not be as obvious um, as some others. Um, who might speak to you. Um, so I have extensive background in South Asia. My research, um, broadly speaking, I've studied religious culture in South Asia, and specifically in Nepal. Um, that's where geographically my research is located. Um, and so I'm very interested in Himalayan cultures um, and in, in kind of trying to understand different forms of Hinduism, uh, particularly the kind that we see in Nepal vis-a-vis -vis Indian Hinduism, which is generally the Hinduism that is talked about in classes. Um, and um, I've been, you know, I've spent several years living in Nepal um, since about 1996 uh, to the present day. Um, and kind of my coup d'etat of my whole experience in this field is being mistaken for a Nepali albino. Um, it's being <laughs> Nepali in the bazaar, and yeah, they thought I was an albino. So, you know, um, I, I've spent some time there for my reason. Um, so, onward to Hindu goddesses. Now, the reason why I wanted to speak to you about Hindu goddesses tonight is because in the topic of women in Hinduism and in South Asian studies, the gods and goddesses figure so prominent, prominently. As you know, I mean, they're ubiquitous. They're everywhere. There are 330 million of them, right? Um, and the whole concept of shakti, um, of power, of this female element of primordial power that is the motivating force, not just for the goddesses, for Devi, for the great goddess, but also the shakti that gives life and action, the means to act to male consorts, or husbands, or any male deity. Um, it is the female power of Shakti that enables them to actually act and do the things that they do, okay? Um, and a lot, speaking of Shakti, um, I didn't realize that we were gonna be quite so hooked up here, otherwise I would have put together a little Shakti point presentation for you of images, um, but alas, um, the PowerPoint is not with me tonight. So, what I wanna do is talk to you a little bit about some of the common categories and perceptions of um, goddesses, and then I want to complicate them a little bit and challenge them a little bit and encourage us to think about and talk about some of the different ways that we understand Hindu goddesses and the roles that they play because they do have such an important, important role in the lives of Hindu people, uh, men and women, and because they, are, they serve as such prominent role models, again, primarily for women. So we have two main traditional categories that Hindu goddesses fall into, right? We have the benign, benevolent consort goddesses, and then we have kind of the fierce virgin warrior goddesses, okay? So let me first start with the consort goddesses. Now this is, you know, Parvati, Lakshmi, Saraswati, um, Radha, Sita, these are these more uh, benevolent consort goddesses. They have, and the, you know, I'm speaking in, in broad generalizations here, but generally speaking, they have little or no independent history or mythology from their, their own consorts, right? Parvati um, is with Shiva, Lakshmi is, um, has Vishnu as her consort, um, Saraswati, Brahma, um, although interestingly, Saraswati has much more of kind of a presence um, in terms of popular culture than does Brahma. But in general, they have little or no independent in, uh, mythology or history from their male consorts. Um, their main distinguishing characteristics is being benevolent, benign, um, these nurturing aspects as mothers 
um, and the submissive, um, subservient role as wives. That's kind of what combines them together in this category. And as such, they provide these exemplary role models for women, particularly in their capacity as wives, right? Traditionally, they serve as, um, you know, grandmothers and mothers say, oh, I want, you know, you need to grow up and be like Parvati. You need to grow up and be like Sita. Um, just like Sita found Haradama, so you too will find your husband, your perfect husband. Um, and although they are primarily categorized um, according to this fact that they don't have that kind of fierce independence that we see in some other goddesses, it's not to say that they don't have any agency or voice. Um, and so, for example, let's take Sita. Um, she is widely known to be, you know, uh, celebrated as the ideal Hindu wife. I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, have heard that. Um, coming at you from various sources, be it media, be it your parents, um, what have you. Um, and so, raise your hand if you're familiar with the, the Sita and the Ramayana. Right, you all kind of know the general gist of the story, right? Um, well, I'm, not, I'm really not going to reiterate. I was going to just even just ask you that. I'm going to reiterate it. What's the point? You guys know what the story is. The point that I want to make about Sita is that despite the fact that she is so submissive and so subservient to her husband, is that she, in fact, also has a different aspect to her. Um, one of the key roles that she plays in the Ramayana is that of Rama's Shakti, of this empowering means to action capacity. Um, so for example, she follows the Rama into the forest, okay? While that seems to be, you know, yes, she's being the dutiful wife, um, she's following him, um, enduring his fate as her own, but at the same time, she's insisting that she go into the forest with him, despite him asking her to stay back, stay in the palace, stay with my family, She's insisting that she go with him, and by doing so, she's forcing him, she's um, turning his hand to fulfill his dharmic duty as her husband. It's his responsibility to protect her and to care for her, right? And by insisting that she follow him into the forest, she's ensuring that he adheres to, that follows that dharma and fulfills it, okay? Um, she also, and so that sends in, you know, every, that sets everything into motion in the broad picture. Um, another example of Sita as Rama Shakti is when she urges him to capture the golden deer that she wants so desperately. If, if Rama had not gone to capture that deer, and if Lakshmana had not gone to help Rama, who we hear crying out in distress, all a ploy um, on the part of Ravana, if Sita had not urged Rama to go capture the deer in the first place, and had not ridiculed Lakshmana to go help Rama, then she would not have been kidnapped by Ravana. So it is Sita who is having an active role in the telling of the Ramayana and in the unfolding of the events. She's not a merely a passive um, passenger along for the ride. She's very much a part of the whole unfolding of the narrative. Um, urging Rama to act. And lastly, she also continually causes Rama again to act by insisting that he be the one who comes to rescue her. Um, she refuses Hanuman's attempts to rescue her. He's there, he's ready to carry her back uh, to the mainland from Lanka. And she says, no, it is it is Rama's duty. He, he needs to be the hero. He is you know, he's the only one, the only man that I will touch. He's the only man I've been thinking of. He's the only man in my mind and my heart. And so again, yes, she's being the dutiful, chaste wife. She's not going to risk ruining her chastity, which could jeopardize Rama and his strength and his powers. But at the same time, she's again causing Rama to act, right? There were other opportunities for her to be rescued, but she is waiting and demanding that Rama again fulfill his duty towards her, okay? So she very much has voice, and she very much has agency um, throughout the narrative. Whether or not these, 
you know, it works in her favor in the end is up for debate. But the point is that she actually, again, is not merely a passive bystander, letting things happen to her, but she's very active in the unfolding of, of the story. Now I want to move on to the warrior goddesses, um, who I think many people find a bit more complicated, um, dare I say a bit more interesting, um, just because they, they have many more kind of controversial or you know surprising aspects to them. So by warrior goddesses, I'm referring by and large to Kali and Durga, right? These are our two main um, virgin warrior goddesses. Um, they're independent, they're unmarried, they're virgins, they're fierce, they're bloodthirsty, um, and they're engaged in a very male occupation battle, right? Um, so in many ways, they're the exact opposite of these benign consort goddesses who are married, who are, you know, wives, who are in the home, who are domestic. Um, Kali and Durga, on the other hand, are, they're out there. They're getting their hands dirty, um, they are feasting on blood, and they are, you know, very much on their own. Um, if, they, if they have um, an association with any males, it's with Shiva, but by and large, um, through most of their mythology, it's their own. Um, and they are, their history is their own. Durga in particular, when she needs help, she has female helpers that she um, enlists. Very rarely does she ever use any male um, attendants. So, speaking of Durga in particular, she's a kind of a curious figure. Um, again, we see her, I think most people are, you know, Durga Puja, Desai, that's what we think of when we think of Durga. We think of, um, of, of blood sacrifice, animal sacrifice, buffalo sacrifice, that's so uh, entwined in uh, Desai. But Durga's character is, is, is kind of interesting. She is actually, this is from the Devi Mahatmya, um, a sixth century text. She's born from the gods. The gods found themselves in a predicament where there was a demon who they could not kill. He had gained so much austerities and so much power from all of um, his ascetic practices that he was unable to be killed by the gods. And so the gods produced Durga. They came together and they each gave her their weapon um, and their power. And so produced from the gods, she's outfitted with all their weapons, and she can do what the gods cannot, which is killed as a demon, Mahisha. Um, and so she is very fierce, she's very foreboding, and, and that's kind of the popular image of her. But if we step back and think about kind of really what kind of dynamic is going on there, what kind of power does she have, right? Um, again, she's born from the gods and she can do what they cannot, yet does she have her own voice? Does she have her own agency in all of this? Um, most of the work that she does is at the behest of the gods. It's on the behalf of the gods. It's not of her own will, it's not of her own devising, it's not for her own benefit, per se, but it's for the gods. So she's independent, but does she really have her own voice? Um, she's also very bloodthirsty, as I've said, but there's a very seductive side to her as well. And images of Durga, which sadly I don't have um, with me right now, she's presented as very beautiful, right? She's an image of, of sheer Hindu beauty, you know? Um, she's decked out, um, and all the, the jewels and her hair is pulled back and she's, she's just presented very regally. I can show some of the images. I don't want to. Sure, sure. That, that would be, crazy that'd be wonderful. I'll just do it right here with snow light. Maybe uh, we're, we'll talk about Durga for a moment and then bring up contrast with, let's start with Durga. Thirsty, 
virgin warrior goddess. But whereas Durga works on behalf of the gods, her work is with the, the aim of, of um, what do I say, maintaining the social order. She's trying to recreate the social order that has gone awry. Right, this demon has taken over, the gods create her, and get her, enlist her to kill the demon so that the gods can once again be at the helm of the heavens. Kali, on the other hand, um, is bloodthirsty in an entirely different way. She is, you know, her depiction, her iconography is very different. Her hair is down and it's flowing and tussled. She's got fangs with blood dripping off of them. She's got long nails. Um, She's, you know, standing on the corpse of Shiva. Some say the sleeping body of Shiva. Um, her, the depiction of her is very different. And as is her personality um, and her mythology. Because what's also interesting about Kali is that the way in which most devotees approach her is as a mother. Thank you, I think that's probably... Yeah, I thought you would bring a contrast to um, Parvati you were talking about the elegance. Okay, um, would you like to show Parvati and yeah, some of the concert goddesses? Yeah, so that we can show how sure. it's contrasting. Going from Durga or Kali. Colleague. 